Hey, good morning, everyone. And uh, I forgot to, uh, well, this is probably unnecessary, show you what's left of me here. Um, we've had a, a lot of work done on computers over the last number of days. And one of our number, uh, Frederick and his wife, Nicole, they've been with us and been very helpful. And uh, I had another computer expert in the house. And, uh, you know, we're just trying to get ready for what is coming, namely our work with the uh, Festival of uh, the New Group of World Servers for a week, every seven years. And the last time, of course, we had it here in the, in the year 2012. And this year, uh, whereas we don't have the full moon, we do have um, a new moon, and it's a powerful one, and there's a really big alignment in Capricorn. So whatever Capricorn means in terms of the law and the inner light and uh, doing things according to law, which uh, seems to be, um, some seem to be deviating from that now, all of that's going to be emphasized. And I have basically told people, look, um, you, you, you have to realize that we are living in times when lawlessness under Uranus, it can mean that too, you know, uh, is going to challenge the good law. And we find this in the United States, and we find this in the United Kingdom, and maybe the reason we do find it is because those two second race soul countries will be uh, good um, prospects for the Christ to set up his headquarters. Now, we don't know exactly where those headquarters are going to be. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not up to us, and I guess he will make the assessment. But uh, these countries on the second ray, um, they, they seem to have been the origin of a certain democratic process. So, of course, we go back to ancient Greece. We have it there, too, in a way. And so there is an attack on to try to uh, return to a dictatorship, which is not an acceptable way of operating. I do want to thank you all for, it looks like uh, most of you got the message that uh, we would be starting now the ASK programs at 6 um, a.m. and 6 p.m. I know it's a little uh, more difficult for people in the United States when we're on the morning schedule. Uh, but uh, Tui and I stay up very late, no matter what. <laughs> and uh, we just need a little clearing room in order to function. So uh, we, we cannot start here at 7, but instead we start at 8 o'clock, finish time, which, like last year and maybe the year before, moves our um, GMT starting time forward a little bit. Uh, well, one hour, really. <laughs> well, okay, Science of Triangles. And I just want to say hi to everybody, to Anne and Anne-Marie and Annette and Antoinette and Barbara, uh, Catherine, Chris, and that's another one of my own uh, addresses. Ishtar, hi, and Karen, yeah, I saw you earlier and uh, hoped you could come back. Carrie, hi, and Lynette, and Martha, and Michael, and Risto. Uh, Vera, yes, and Heidi, and, uh, and Veronica, welcome. And over here, Joe and I are taking care of things. Uh, well, Joe especially is taking care of things. So let's just have a, a little bit of an alignment. Our purpose. Is to come together. 
we might say as one being, um, one consciousness, no matter where we might be located. And our purpose is to be a kind of an inner point of focus and uh, of spiritual receptivity, at least upon the mental plane, so that we can have the mind held steady in the light. There's so much to know. We can understand the, uh, I'll use the word, fathomlessness of the ageless wisdom, the unfathomable, at least at our stage, ageless wisdom. And last night, at least last night for us here in Europe, we were concentrating uh, on the 12th uh, identify as being work, and we continue with that as well as to learn in detail the contents of the ageless wisdom. This is, uh, we're working on the ray of specialized detail and meticulous entirety. And we're trying to find the divine patterns, which may after all be set forth as geometrical. So we're in a deep plunge into the science of relations. And we're working in the world of relativity, which is the world of the great illusion. And meanwhile, some of our studies are aimed at the complete simplicity of reality. So, okay, we will do both. Now, um, we've been looking at the seven constellations and the eight constellations, and I hope I can... Um, find our way here. Um, this is our 57th program on the science of uh, triangles, and we're on page 476 of the book Esoteric Astrology. And after that, after we finish this section, I will go digging for other references because uh, scattered throughout his books, uh, are all of these references to triangles. And what I would suggest is that when a, a new triangle comes up over the horizon, and maybe you haven't heard of it before, you do make a note. You just, you know, you put it down, either on computer or by pen or whatever, put it down, and it will be uh, something that you can take into consideration. We're dealing simply with the ABCs of this stupendous subject, and not all triangles are equally relevant to the development of our planet or the development of the human being. But there are many that are very relevant, and we want to know the manner in which they are relevant. So that's our that's our work. You know, um, we've been looking at. Uh, I said last time this is a good stopping place, and just to um, review, one way to look at this sevenfold succession of triangles is to consider Leo as the first initiation. 
to consider uh, Virgo, Leo Virgo, as the first initiation. It's one of those signs. Gemini also is connected. And um, Libra and Taurus involve the second initiation and the balancing of the pairs of opposites on the astral plane. One, the desire for personality activity, and the other, the desire for soul activity. Then Sagittarius becomes the one-pointed disciple, especially of the second degree, aiming towards the mountain of revelation, which is experienced actually in Capricorn and Aquarius. But let's call Capricorn, well, Capricorn is available for all five initiations, initial initiations. Uh, as I say, you know, you can use almost any sign of the zodiac to help achieve a particular initiation. So let's just make it easy and say Capricorn third initiation, the entry into the supernal light provided by Venus, which is the hierarchical ruler of Capricorn. Let's call Aquarius the fourth initiation, though it has place in relation to the third and even to the fifth. And Pisces, the fourth and fifth initiations, a particularly difficult path to take, the path of self-abnegation. And we surrender a great deal. It's the path of the world's saviors. And almost, uh, I would say, you know, the masters we're working with have a lot to do with this sign. Master Kutumi, um, the Christ, uh, the Buddha, I think Pisces is figuring prominently in their world saviorship. And then, of course, we take this sequence of astrological signs and we can make triangles out of them, and they, they do rather tell a story. Now, you know, um, when you're looking at let's say, this picture, it's not that the petals of the egoic lotus open up in exact sequence. There is overlap. Now, DK talks about that a bit. It's not like we have to spend X number of million years in the first petal. We do spend a long time. And then when it's completely unfolded, petal number two begins. No, it's not like that at all. It's almost like uh, in threes they open up. So while there's a major activity in petal number one, long time ago, there was some activity in petal number two and... Uh, the vibration was giving us a tiny bit in petal number three, and then we moved on to petal number two, three, and four. And then we moved on to petals number three, four, and five. And some of these are really transitional series. They take us from the Hall of Ignorance, petals one, two, three, where we haven't any idea that there is such a thing as a higher self. And they, uh, into the uh, Hall of Learning, petals number four, five, and six, but the transition there. Well, learning about what? Learning about the love energy and the higher of the pairs of opposites. And then there'll be a transitional period into, into the um, Hall of Wisdom, petals number seven, eight, and nine. 
and maybe um, we can begin to consider transitions not just into wisdom but more into life which uh, which aspect the being aspect the synthesis aspect is emphasized by the three synthesis petals and by the reflection of the uh, monad as the egoic lotus in the midst of the flower now we're going to be able to see this flower maybe in ourselves and in others as we progress along the initiatory path of training there is a time reserved and maybe it's um, a huge amount of learning from initiation three to four and uh, we're all where many of these psychic abilities uh, come into focus and then there's also a further clarification and revelation and illumination as we transit from pedal number four to pedal number five. Now, all of this is going on inside us as our initiatory rank is, is rising. We don't have to worry too much about it, basically. We do what we can do to help others according to what we've achieved. And every effort we make is not selfishly done. Okay, because, you know, you say, well, look, now I can do this. Now I can do that. No, it's done for the sake of how we can express the divine plan. And presumably with ever greater skill. You know, one of Alice Bailey's uh, developmental words or keynotes was uh, skill in action. She was DRS, D as in David. She was detachment. You know, second race soul needs to detach. She was R for rest because she got precious little of it. And there was a more efficient way of operating. And then she was S for skill in action. So many, many things are operating, we might say, simultaneously and in an overlapping manner rather than in a strictly beginning to end, beginning to end, beginning to end, that kind of. Uh, sequential manner and we just have to be aware of it uh, while we are making let's say mental progress we may be continuing to make emotional progress and physical progress purification radiation and so forth so we work in a number of different areas simultaneously now you know maybe for you or for me a particular problem is the issue and a particular triangle is the issue if we turned um you know let's see here excuse me i'll find it if i went into cosmic fire and i went to page um 169 approximately I would find triangles all kinds of triangles which indicate developmentally what I might be going through and any one of these might be the focus we have now frankly it, some of this happened so long ago that we're not going to be focused on the pranic triangle unless we really need to do some work with vitality. We're not strictly controlled from the astral plane. That's not our focus. Nor are we strictly controlled from the lower mental plane. But, uh, you know, most of us are right here, man, partially controlled 
by the ego, advanced man. The heart, the, the throat, and uh, four centers, and the alpha major. And then perhaps, um, if we know we are an initiate of the threshold at least, and some of us are, of course, having taken the first initiation, then we would be in category number five, heart, throat, and the seven head centers, master centers in the head, other than just the five or four plus one. And then probably we're not at number six yet which would be spiritual man to the fifth initiation. He is spiritual because he's entered the spiritual triad at the third initiation. The heart, the seven head centers, and the two many petaled lotuses. And by that, I think uh, we might mean the Ajna and the crown center. Of course, there's another way in which even the Alta Major Center is seen to have 96 petals, the way the uh, Ajna Center does. So into the intricacy of the centers, we will be guided by the Master when it is time, but everybody's working in a particular triangle, and, you know, probably for a number of lives, to master that lesson until the energy moves up further and the initiatory status increases. But, you know, the, the main thing in all of this is not that we want this for ourselves. We, we want this for our usefulness in helping others and making sure the divine plan uh, can more rapidly manifest. So going on here a bit, um, let's see here where we are. Just overlapping a bit. It is not my intention to analyze these crises. And we remember on 472 is one list of crises. So here's 476, and uh, there it is. There's your list, and you should be conversant with what this means in relation to the long, long uh, journey of humanity from individualization all the way to liberation, and why those signs are prominent. And then maybe you can pick, you know, uh, out of them a triangle with which you may be working. So always um, do what you can to explain the triangles you notice. And I'm saying that, you know, do what you can to explain the triangles you notice, because it's not just enough to say, oh, yeah, this is an important triangle. We have to know the function. And the function, of course, may change because they are triangles in rotation and what those cycles may be. Okay, well, we're just going to have to uh, wait on that one. So those are um, the crises of the soul. And then we've also seen different stages of evolution in this particular figure. And we can identify these um, in a different way. We might say, you know, Cancer to Capricorn, that can take us all the way through human evolution. And Gemini through Virgo, it can take us from the intelligent human being uh, on up uh, to the the human being in which the Christ is being born. And the Capricorn uh, Virgo Leo can take us from the beginning of initiation 
all the way up to the final burning ground in Leo. Now, what I've tried to explain is that no one sign of the zodiac means only one thing. It can mean many things. It depends on the form through which it works. It depends on the degree of development of the human being receiving the energy. So it seems the most important thing to be helpful is to make an assessment of where the human being you hope to help finds himself or herself on the spiritual path. And then we can know how the signs of the zodiac and their ruling planets, orthodox, esoteric, and hierarchical, will be received and will be applied. It takes a little work now to, to, to define these things for yourself. But it's worth the effort. All right, I said this is a good stopping place. <laughs> And that was the last time. So we've dealt with the seven crises. And we've dealt with different zodiacal spans, S-P-A-N-S, that describe progress from one phase of human evolution to another, whether it's the whole thing or from the beginning to the level of intelligence or from the level of intelligence to real um, discipleship or from real discipleship up through initiation and into liberation. All of those things have been mentioned. I would also point out, uh, let's see, maybe not pointing anything out until I can do this properly. I would also point out that I have, again, necessarily, because of time and space limitations, even though, you know, we try to prove that time and space are not real, <laughs> we try to prove that, but we've got to live with them, you know. So I've also tried to point out, again, necessarily, that I have, again, necessarily only depicted the three triangles in a certain order, with the lower points expressing the energy of certain constellations. So these are the points of expression. We might say we've, we've come to the point of initiation when Capricorn is the expressive point. We've reversed the wheel. We've begun... In Cancer, we've reversed the wheel in Aries, and we've become some kind of initiate in Capricorn. And, uh, you know, Virgo uh, is going to lead us to, the, after great struggle, to the birth of the Christ within the heart and the uh, uprising of the consciousness associated with the second aspect of divinity. Um, Leo could be that, but in this particular case, I think um, we're dealing with the progress of the initiate as he or she heads for a final type of liberation at the fifth degree, which Leo, the fifth sign, indicates. So what you should have in order to put these triangles together correctly is a list of the kinds of things they can represent. And then from that list, you select what is appropriate according to the form or the person in front of you. This is going to be very rare. A person who's involved in the third, fourth, and fifth degrees is not going to need our help. We're going to need their help. <laughs> okay. So, um, the lower points expressing 
the energy of certain constellations. And I've just gone through that a little bit to show you what energies can be expressed via Capricorn, via Virgo, and via Leo. In this form, they depict the final outcome and the final results of a particular group of three crises. Now, um, it's interesting here. Uh, these crises take place over a period of time. So there's a cycle involved in the crises as well. And I think what we notice here is that he's only mentioned three. And there are other phases that we could involve ourselves with in study. But DK is careful not to overwhelm our minds so that we become confused. He just mentions some of what it is possible for him to mention. It must be remembered, he says, you know, he's writing in black here. It must be remembered that only through much repetition and frequent focused effort are the results attained. Now think about that. I mean, we become aware of a crisis and we then become aware of the triple uh, word form called uh, crisis, tension, and emergence. CTE, crisis, tension, and emergence. And once the crisis is understood and all the pain of it is entered, then comes a relationship with a higher aspect which is necessary if the crisis is going to be solved. And that creates tension. The tension is a pulling in two directions. The old uh, direction of rotary motion and uh, inhibited movement and the new direction of expansiveness. Tension is created and then the person is sort of on the cross in that tension. And then, of course, emergence, which is a kind of liberation and an emergence into the new and from the old. So it's a bit like, you know, ruling planets, uh, say you've got uh, Aries, you've got Mars and then Mercury and then Uranus, depending on whether we're talking about the orthodox rulership the esoteric rulership, or the hierarchical rulership. Well, there's always going to come a point when after tension between pulling forward or, you know, trying to go forward and being pulled back, there will be a victory. There will be an emergence. And you might ask yourself right now, let's, let's just have a little reflection. what kind of tension in the way I've tried to explain it here are you experiencing in your life? You know, you, this tension is not usually on the same level. It is, a, it is a tension between a higher of the pairs of opposites and a lower. So, you know, something in us is pulling forward. 
And usually, for people like ourselves, it's the contrast between soul culture and personality habit. Our personality ray is strong, and the soul ray has not completely overcome it or made that personality ray a subsidiary instrument of the soul ray. So just, you know, try to identify what that is, where the tension is, so you can put the weight of your consciousness on the side which moves towards emergence. So it must be remembered, he says, that only through much repetition and frequent focused effort, daily, I would say, are these results attained. A crisis is brought about by a certain habit of mind developed in a vehicle. And, you know, then you get, I think, what you can call rotary motion. It is surmounted in time only by a certain habit and rhythm of the spiritual content of a man's nature. Now think of it, you know, maybe, maybe you know, you're not the seventh rate type, maybe you are. I had a friend, he, he's still involved in the Lucis Trust a long time. And I think he's meditated every day of his life. He has such a strong seventh ray that he has set up his meditation schedule is such that he just doesn't miss a beat. That's the rhythm. And he's really giving his soul an opportunity to get through by developing this higher soul-inspired meditative habit. So the higher pattern of behavior which is more orderly and more mental, I would say, has to be substituted for the oftentimes chaos of the personality with the personality looking like it's rather out of control. I'm going to put to you over here on the other side. Yeah, the personality is so often out of control and its particular rhythms are not all that regular. But the higher spiritual rhythms will come in. Okay, and that's what we have to do. And that is going to produce an emergence. Now look, crisis, tension, emergence. It goes without saying, that's a triangle. So where are you? in some of the important things happening in your life? Are you in the midst of a painful crisis? Have you viewed what it is that will help to solve that crisis and thus created a tension between the personality tendencies and the higher possibilities? Or do you feel yourself having worked in tension for a long enough time, emerging from the situation? Pause, let's pause for a moment and ask ourselves that situation. Where are we in an important what we consider to be an important process in our life. Is it crisis? Is it tension? Is it emergence? You know, in the cycles of the new group of world servers, there is a three-year rhythm. And every year it's the new thing, crisis, tension, or emergence. There's also a seven-year rhythm, and there's a nine-year rhythm. And, you know, in our broadcasts, uh, to you and me, we will do our best to bring the idea of these rhythmic cycles forward.
and maybe there are several processes that we're working on simultaneously. And one of them is causing a crisis, and in another, we're in a point of tension, and in another, we feel, oh, we're breathing free. Now, for instance, uh, let me look at the fixed signs of the zodiac. Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius. Now, we can set up a triangle of the first three. Blinding light, okay. Fiery pain, the sacred pains of Leo. Bitter woe, you've lost everything. You're losing. The things you cherish are being taken away from you. And yet, the cross of liberation. So the emergent point on that fixed cross is going to be Aquarius, liberation. Then we might, you know, in this case, it's a three hovering above the one, which is the point of emergence. And sometimes you will see that, not just two and one, but a three hovering above a one. Now you can work on every cross that way, and maybe we'll be able to take up, uh, as part of the study of the science of triangles, we'll take up the study of the science of the crosses, because they are intimately related. So we have to develop a new habit of mind that saves us from the rotary, rotary, round and round, the same, the same motion, which is uh, of the personality. And new habits have to be built, and obviously they have to be cultivated. You don't make a good spiritual habit by trying to do it once. You've got to keep going with it. And then the spiritual content of our nature will make its impression. So a greater pattern is imposed upon a lesser one. It is the, says the Tibetan, it is the establishing of a certain objective rhythm. Notice objective, which produces a crisis, an objective rhythm is probably quite limited uh, in that, you know, here's what's really causing the crisis. Inside you, or, or being you, or the essence of you is the spirit. It just doesn't want to be confined. And we've established objective patterns in the outer worlds and the spirit comes along and says oh what a prison so it starts to break down those outer patterns and bring forward newer ones which give us greater scope for freedom so this crisis it is the establishing of a certain objective rhythm which produces a crisis because we have to break up that objective rhythm because it's too limiting. And it is the emergence of a particular subjective rhythm. Think about that now. Subjectivity doesn't begin until the soul is reached. There's a real important distinction between subjectivity and subtlety. There are subtle bodies, the emotional, the mental, the etheric. They are not subjective. It is the emergence of a particular subjective rhythm which enables a man to surmount the crisis and to capitalize on opportunity. Please bear this in mind and keep your eyes open because those Saturnian difficulties which settled down upon us and every sincere disciple are 
moments of opportunity. So what is the subjective rhythm that you are trying to impose upon your nature, lower nature? Okay, a little more. These um, seven crises that we've been listing, I seem, uh, yeah, also can be related to the seven centers in the vital or etheric body. And whenever a, a chakra is about to really open up into usefulness, there's going to be a crisis as it affects the energy flows within your etheric body and demands that it have its place. Now, not all centers are developed fully uh, one after another. There's a big, big overlap going on in all the chakra development. And here's, you know, what we might see. Cancer as the beginning, along with a certain type of Leo. Individualization, the first incarnation of humanity. Aries, you reverse the wheel after millions of years. And you head towards spirituality. Capricorn, initiation begins. Gemini, too, it rules the first initiation. But from another point of view, Capricorn rules the third initiation, and Gemini, related to the cosmic Christ, rules the fourth. But these are not in order. Scorpio is operative at the first three initiations, but particularly the second. And Virgo... Hmm, well... Virgo is operative at the first initiation and at the purificatory second initiation. But it's also the sign of the monad. And Virgo is helping to open up the monadic plane to you. See, you know, I think I've shown this before and we'll show it again. And here it is. Virgo is ruling the monadic plane. The hierarchical ruler is Jupiter. The color is blue. It's a big second ray factor under the first ray. And this particular very high hierarchy called the burning suns of desire function under it. Then what about Leo? Isn't Leo the monad too? And yes, it is. It's the monad liberated into the sea of fire. So what are the chakras connected here? And I have some proposals. Because remember, all of your chakras, they tend to triangulate. Just as I showed page 170, 169, in a treatise on cosmic fire. So the uh, later chakras, the higher chakras, develop later than the earlier ones. Chakras ruled by the non-sacred planets are going to develop quite early when they are ruled by monadic first-ray Uranus and monadic second-ray Neptune. They're going to develop later. So maybe cancer has something to do with the base of the spine. Uh, this is when we first anchor ourselves as a human being. And the cancer is the fourth sign. And what is it about the base of the spine that suggests the number four? It's the cross. The cross in the circle is the symbol of, of the base of the spine. Now, Virgo starts us with a number of things. It can have much to do with the fertility 
a fecundity of nature is the plant kingdom in a way the plant kingdom six ray and virgo the sacral center can be involved here in terms of the fertility of it but also later the heart center so we have to be able to say that a sign of the zodiac is not just applicable to the development of only one center it's applicable to the development of a number of centers if you're going to have the birth of the christ in the heart and virgo is going to be really important about that you know you're going to have virgo relating to the heart center also because virgo represents the birth of the christ now with aries Virgo uh, Aries represents the cosmic Christ. And so it's going to be some 12 fold process as what the Christ does involves always the number 12, especially Pisces, the 12th sign, and the end of the 12 fold circle. But it's not going to take place between the shoulder blades in the torso, it's going to take place in the head. And there's a great center there, a 12-fold major center in the head that Aries can be associated with. So I'm, I'm, what I'm doing right now is I'm taking certain of these signs that we've been studying and which are the source of energies we are using and the source of triangles we are using. And I'm suggesting chakras with which they may be associated just as DK is telling us there are. What about Scorpio? Well, um, it's got a lot of uh, fourth ray in it. And via Mars, the ruler, uh, quite a bit of the sixth ray. So Scorpio rules the battleground. And if we look at what has been the battleground in terms of the history of humanity, we go right back to DK's statement that India has been a battleground down the ages. And that the battlefield of Kurukshetra is familiar to every struggling disciple as he tries to balance the lower and the higher pairs of opposites. So this, the fights of that very difficult second initiation can be ruled by Scorpio. Aries, too, can represent the sacral center because Mars is ruling the sacral center as well as Uranus. He tends to give us Uranus. Now, let me again, for those who don't remember, turn to that page in Esoteric Astrology. Okay. Where are we here? Okay, I'm, I hope I haven't lost my way. There we are. Okay. So, Scorpio, Japan, Mars, the um, the ritual suicide, you know, where you're sort of slicing yourself in half, <laughs> the Harakiri tradition, all of that has to do with the battleground. We human beings, it's even tougher for on us to go through the fourth, through the 
second initiation than it is to have the clear-eyed approach, which takes us through the fourth degree. Okay, Gemini can start out as the throat center for the stage of intelligent man, but it's also found as one of those signs involved in the relationship between the soul and the personality, the birth of the Christ, again, in the heart center. So those two um, signs, Virgo second ray, sixth ray, Gemini second ray, are involved with the heart center. Capricorn is one of those signs we're studying, and it's right here. This is, uh, I mean, of course, it's at the throat too, but this is the major place, the Ajna center, the fifth ray, because, you know, the fifth ray is associated with the concrete mind in Capricorn. He hints at it, you know. And the third initiation. And uh, Leo <clears throat> would be the crown the dome, the whole thing. Aries in here and Leo up there or reversed. The whole process is crowned by Leo at the fifth degree and the great head center is there along with Aries, two fire signs. The other sign, Sagittarius, is more about moving the energy and but also here where the arrow of vision goes forth and you shoot your arrow in toward the promised land and the great mountain of initiation so those are some suggestions of chakras with which the signs of crisis with which we have been dealing are associated and advanced students, he says, will later find that there is a close cyclic interrelation between, maybe we'll have to take this up next time, the seven planes of divine expression, the seven resultant, states of resultant consciousness, because when you open up a chakra, the consciousness changes. and the seven crises leading to the expansion of consciousness. I mean, look, a crisis is important because it shows you you are up against the limitation. Now, you're either just going to go around in that crisis like many human beings do, being on the fourth ray, they don't know how to get out of it, so they just have a life full of trouble and conflict, or you're going to emerge into harmony, which is a Buddhic emergence. So the seven crises and the seven initiations that the crises lead towards. We'll go over this next time. It all makes sense. I think you'll agree. Yes, I think so. So we'll take up this idea of the interrelationship between the planes, the states of consciousness, the seven crises, and the seven initiations. So one, two, three, four. I always have to see where I'm going, you know, because it's so easy to get lost. So, right here. And next time it will be, this time it has been number 57, and we're, we've been here on the 30th of October, and it'll be 58 next time. Pretty big numbers. 
And it will be not, uh, let's see, what have we got here? The 6th of November. Unless, of course, there's some unexpected program that has to take the place of this one. For instance, if a full moon occurred when a program like this is supposed to occur, then we would naturally defer to the full moon. Now, let's see how far we've gone. A lot of this is my own writing, but DK, as I say, is writing in black. And here he, he is writing in black, and we're seeing where the signs do belong. And uh, I guess I'm having a little trouble figuring out where we are. Let's see if I go to uh, Esoteric Astrology and 476. That will help me. Sorry if you get an earful on that. Okay. And somehow something didn't get quite uh, brought forward. We're on page 476, let's say. And let's just say that we will begin it next time. 476. And <clears throat> begin on the 6th of November. And there we are. All right. Now, friends. I know I've talked a bit. I always ask your forgiveness here. But I've tried to lay out a, f a few pages and what we have to think about when we do this or what we could think about. So what do you want to say? What do you want to ask? What do you want to uh, look at more closely? Have you found any connection in your own uh, in your own life I suppose that's the important thing so is there anything you would like to we're talking about crisis sequence triangles we're talking about overlapping from one stage to another from the hall of ignorance to the hall of learning from the hall of learning to the hall of wisdom from the hall of wisdom to the hall of life. We're talking about progress, and we're talking about how different triangles can be used at different stages of evolution uh, to advance the particular stage that stands in front of you. All you need to know, says the Tibetan, is the, co the constitution of man and your next step ahead. You would think that would be easy, you know, but uh, so many, um, even if we know something of the Constitution of Man, we fool ourselves about our next step ahead. Okay, so I'm looking for any thoughts that you may have about what we've covered today. Or if you don't like to talk about what we've covered today than just anything in the cultism period. And we can take it up as one big subject. Is there anything? I've got my eye open, but maybe Joe will. I'm not seeing anything yet from question box or Gosh, hands sure. raised. I feel I feel like I've been to the bowling alley and I've thrown the ball down the alley and there's no pins standing. Now there's a question. <laughs> I was worried about just getting strikes, only strikes. <laughs> okay, that by the way that question uh, 
I hope it's not mine. Oh, here it is from Ishtar. All right. So, Ishtar. It has been a number of crises of opportunity where health issues are a way to communicate an area of personal growth. Yes, you know, health issues can be strictly personal. I mean, you, you know, you just do something wrong and abuse the body in some way and uh, it reacts and there's a problem and you're into a personal crisis. But there's another reason that health issues appear. He's very definite about this. When you bring in a higher energy to which the lower configuration is not adapted, the strain of trying to receive and incorporate those higher energies can and will produce irritation, inflammation, and general health issues. So we have to distinguish between just abusing the body and, you know, just doing the wrong things for its maintenance and its care. I mean, if I drove a car and I never changed the oil, I, I'm going to have some problems eventually. And those other kinds of issues which have to do with bringing a higher energy in connection with the lower energy. You say, through the Vedic way of understanding chakras in the body, and of course, look, the strictly Indian system is a little different from what's being presented here in this um, Ageless Wisdom Tibetan presentation. And, uh, you know, you, one can learn about both and probably there's going to be insight to be gathered from both. But we can make any personal crisis into a spiritual crisis, which is where it belongs, and gives us the opportunity to uh, advance some kind of uh, normal crisis, maybe someone is overweight and uh, they, you know, they don't get enough exercise and it's affecting their quality of life. It, it seems strictly personal. But if one really attacks it, it will open doors to a spiritual influx. I've had this in my life, you know, there was a time in my 30s when I say, well, why am I slowing down here? What's going on here? And I used to see all these people running. And I said to myself, stupidly, why are they running? <laughs> why, why do I see them out here every day? Then I began to research the whole matter and discovered the cause behind it. So I attacked the personal crisis and it opened doors to higher possibilities. So that's often the case. Any crisis can be made to show its spiritual implications. So, you know, if we understand the Veda, okay, good. We'll understand certain things that are supplementary to the kind of uh, system the Tibetan uh, is presenting. So thank you, Ishtar. And here is uh, Michael. Placing a greater pattern on a lesser, let's see if I can read this. And one reminds me of Uranus. Mm -hmm. It's like Uranus on Saturn, isn't it? How an under underutilized rebellious quality, yes, can be aligned with the higher order and made useful for service. This takes us into Carl Jung. He basically uh, looks at the typology of man as intuitive, feeling, sensory, thinking. 
And so the sensory opposes the intuitive and the feeling opposes the thinking. And there's always an inferior function which is not much recognized and doesn't work too well for us. And we can integrate it with the other functions and make it suitable for revelation. And we don't necessarily like to do that. So often we like to express according to what is easiest for us to express. We have a natural... Uh, natural inclination to go with what is flowing. I certainly have this in my life, you know. Sometimes I say, well, I can think, I can talk, I can feel, but what about the physical plane, you know? I force myself, in the old days anyway, to do things on the physical plane because I had no inclination whatsoever to do those things. It was maybe the sensation function in the Jungian terms. Of course, you know, I looked for one earth sign and I found it in my chart. It was the planet Venus. And it would, um, I liked to sing. And opera became my profession for many years. And so the funny thing was, that this inferior function, sensation on the physical plane, was made to develop by having to bear the weight of living in the world. And so there's been some development, not enough, but uh, we all have an inferior function and it needs cultivation. So it can be rebellious or it can be lazy. What can I say? You know, we'd rather do something else that works for us already rather than go through the slow process of, you know, cultivating something new that we're not really very good at yet. Okay, but greater upon the lesser and Uranus, of course, I think you're right here, Michael. Uranus is the archetype, and Saturn is the conditions. Our job is to, looking at the map, okay, is to take the four Uranian planes, probably whose subtle color is violet, and impose them upon the three conditioned Saturnian planes. It's like 21 is imposed, uh, 28 is imposed upon 21, and the violet is imposed upon the green. But, you know, that's the way we grow. The archetype tells us what we have to aim towards, and we have to uh, endure the friction which occurs through that imposition. Just try to run counter to a well-established habit, and you're into a whole period of retraining. I'm sure we've all been through it. And probably there's a lot more to do in the retraining. Now, I'll go on. And Veronica, it is in, in Libra, it is said that there were only 10 zodiacal signs. I think, you know, we, we had um, probably Aries, Pisces, and... Uh, Libra, Virgo were one uh, sign, that would make 10, but Libra was also as the clause of the scorpion, joined unto the scorpion. And so maybe that was one of the ways of eliminating one sign. Somewhere he even 
talks about 11 signs. Now, does that mean that these constellations don't exist? I don't see it that way. They exist, but man's receptivity of their true nature is not yet possible because his development does not make it possible. Remember, there were once eight zodiacal signs, maybe stopping with Scorpio. What it really means is that man's development stopped with Scorpio, not that the constellations Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces did not exist. Of course, there's a whole thing there about studying the age of constellations and when they would likely have been most in power. So, there was a time for number 10, you say. I was trying to think, what does that mean on a human being? Could it mean the synthesis of two chakras in one, because Libra is important in terms of uniting and synthesis. Certainly we do, we do an interesting thing around the time of the fourth initiation. We unite the angel and the dweller, and each side of Libra represents one of them. And if you want to have nice dweller problems, just look at your seventh house. That's going to be the place where you are confronting the dweller. So you ask, could it mean the synthesis of two chakras in one, and what chakras could they be? I don't think we have to limit ourselves to just two. It, it, it all depends on what stage we find ourselves in. For many people, the throat and the solar plexus would be quite enough and maybe this would take place around the first initiation. For other people, we might call it the head and the heart. And there would be um, real um, abilities in each one, but each one would be striving towards dominance. So also the 12-fold... <laughs> I can't really read this, Joe. Can you help me with a text? Ah, uh, yes. Give me a second. I lost the box. Twelve-fold chakra in the head. Is it the heart in the head? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. So um, we unite according to our stage two. And it's a bridging. Now, look, it's really easy in one way. You're taking the first initiation, sacral to throat. You're taking the second initiation or recapitulating it like Alice Bailey did, solar plexus to heart. You're taking the third initiation, the beginning, let's just say the base of the spine and other chakras to the ajna. You're taking the fourth initiation and everything below gets centralized in the heart above with perhaps some heart in the head, and finally at the fifth initiation, you are taking the progress from the base of the spine to the highest head center and also including the heart in the head. So Libra could be, you know, the fusion of those centers and can, and can certainly indicate that kind of uh, a duality. And, and so does Gemini, of course, in that respect. But but it's not just that there's 10. There's 8. There's 10. There's 11. 
there's 12 in how he discusses it. And uh, maybe if we go way back in the history of humanity, we find that mankind was responsive in a total way to fewer, still fewer, of those constellations which are forming signs which are supposed to direct human thinking and behavior and general expression. So the history of each period probably can be related to the signs to which we are responsive. Now, these days, we are supposed to be responsive to all 12, but not everybody is, of course, not to the higher aspects. Disciples should be responsive to Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces in differing degrees. But none, none of us is a world savior yet. None of us is an initiate of the fifth degree. None of us in all probability in these discussions is an initiate of the fourth degree. If there's some third degree, either in preparation or achievement, it's possible. But uh, where we normally find ourselves is within the second degree, maybe past, and looking towards real entry into the kingdom of souls, which would happen at the third degree. Okay, now let's see where I am here. And thanks, Joe, I may have more of that. A throat is, okay, no, it's in. here's Ishtar again. Yes, thank you. We can see the attention to a particular issue. Yes, to grow, yes. Identify the issue. That's the amazing thing. The people in DK's groups, many of them, they didn't know what their issue was. What was their next step ahead? What was their inhibition? What was that small grain of sand stopping the wheel of their progress? And he would bring it to their attention. And oftentimes they just didn't like what he said. Some of them stuck with it and others got hurt feelings and quit. <laughs> we have to say, oh, I would never quit if the master said something to me. But then again, they thought it was Alice Bailey talking because the master would never say such things. When in fact, it was the exact reversal with Alice Bailey saying, no, no, you can't say that. <laughs> but he said he would be frank, and he was. So anyway, we see the attention to a particular issue grow. You lost your voice recently uh, as, as the throat center is opening, and I need total less for words. Our power. Now, is there more there, Joe, that I... Yeah, a difficult area for me. Well, look, I've got it now. Where there is overemphasis, attack is possible. DK says, you think the counterforce, the lords of form, who are against your disciplic progress, are going to attack you in your weak, weak points. It isn't necessarily so. They may attack where you find yourself to be the strongest and you just start overemphasizing and overemphasizing until you are a person who is out of balance. So sometimes um, we have to focus, let's say, like for instance, if I thought in my own case that there was too much mind and too much intelligence too much emphasis upon knowing with the head. And I got various symptoms, you know, and laryngitis or inflammation or, you know, any of those things. I would say to myself, well, wait a second. I've got an overemphasis problem. What should I be emphasizing in order to bring this into balance? And it would probably be the heart. 
it probably should not be immediately the will, because there's a sequence there from intelligent creativity to the heart, love and inclusion, to the will, the impressing upon conditions that which the archetype demands. Yeah. Okay. So when we find ourselves to be out of balance in a triangular area, and we can notice it by pain, by irritation, by inflammation, by hyperactivity, by the uh, disappearance of another chakra that should be associated, a lack of functioning, too much here, not enough there, change our emphasis. Even though we might not exactly like to do it because it's so easy to flow along a certain line. I'll give you an example. If I found that I had a third ray mind, which I believe I do, um, and it was all intellectual and all mental, and it was easy to do, more or less, I would begin to be a little suspicious. I would, I would, my, my balance meter would talk to me and say, you know, there's too much of this and you're becoming an unbalanced person. I would go for work on the heart. And then after I finished the work on the heart, well, you never finish, you know, but there would be the work with the will. It's almost like you never dare put ray one and three together just by themselves because it can lead to a very willful material situation in which the heart is really excluded. So the heart, the love, must follow the intelligence and precede the will. And I would hope that I would know enough to say, okay, um, I'll do this now. Just like when you find yourself, you really, you really love Coca-Cola and it's killing you, you know. You don't just keep on drinking the Coke. Or like some of these people have proven they, uh, <laughs> they are really uh, fanatics and they get out there to prove something and they do. This guy, a year or two ago, he started a series called Super Size Me. And he just about killed himself. I think he ate at McDonald's every day and only those burgers you know, supersize, whatever it was, the name of it. He just ate that, and he just became worse and worse and worse, just trying to demonstrate what would happen if you limited your diet to what is offered in the fast food industry. So balance is a big thing, and that's where Libra comes in, Ishtar. There's just this moment when the Ida and the Pingala on either side of the Shushumna have to be in balanced relation in order to achieve this rising of the Kundalini in the proper way. And so you don't shake apart like an ill-balanced machine. If we're not balanced, we run all kinds of risks. And one of the biggest risks is we let in energies that just should not be let in. We, 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 we burn things up and the etheric web is no longer a protection and we're in trouble. So treading the path is a very Libran thing. Interestingly enough, Libra 
is ruled by the triangle and it's called the triple flowers and it is it brings in the third ray and has everything to do with the number three and it rules the atomic plane which is the third plane so libra is one of the connections to the science of triangles okay all right some interesting questions coming up here and um Vera has her hand up. Right. Okay. Let's get to Vera here. Thank you. And yeah, Vera. Yeah, crisis. So usually it it comes knocking on my door several times before the. So uh, it comes over and over and asking. Um, I thought I had dealt with that, but no. And the final final sort of dealing a resolution comes when I manage to align all the three bodies, the mental, astral and physical etheric. So it does need to, they all need to be aligned mm. with the correct sort of attitude and then the door opens. Okay. But it's, so it, the, the, the etheric physical level is, needs to be involved in order to change some pattern. Mm. behavior it makes That's it fine. makes sense and you know sometimes if you study esoteric astrology you'll find that um, Sagittarius is this um, sign which is indicating the straight alignment from top to bottom of the different vehicles and we can't be a good magician unless there is an alignment uh, between the personality vehicles and the personality itself. And so often the astral body is out of alignment, causing all kinds of difficulty, the Tibetan tells us. So alignment itself is kind of an open sesame, kind of open mm. opens the door. And, you know, we every once in a while, we have to check in with ourselves and find out what is the condition, the balance, the ease, the harmony in the different factors of our nature. We might just go along, go along, go along and not mm. pay attention to something that's frictional. You know, maybe you put on a new shoe. Maybe a lot of us have had this experience. And before you know it, something's rubbing and something there's a blister and there's a problem. Um, one has to detect the sources of irritation so you go to the shoe you work it you soften it maybe you put some kind of oil in it or whatever and and then the irritation is no longer going to be there so to detect the irritation the imbalance this is important and oftentimes we don't want to do that someone else has to remind us you know you're irritating me <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe we have to take a look at what that is and uh, tend to it. So, look, there's a lot of, uh, if I was a violinist, I would, and I had a good violin or whatever, even if I didn't have such a great violin, I'd want to tend to the care of the instrument. Now, you know, when you play the violin, you have to rosin your bow. I played the viola for many years, you know, but same thing. And then that rosin gets all over the place and it's sticky and it, it clogs up the strings. And, uh, you know, you, ha you have to take it off. You have to find this, the solvent that will remove that uh, source of distortion. So, investigation of the condition of our instrument is a big deal. And that doesn't mean we should become self-obsessed about it, because a lot of people do get that way. They mm. pay, pay so much attention to the instrument that uh, they, you know, they forget what the instrument is for. But if, unless we have both things operating, a good instrument and a clear idea 
of what has to happen so we make our contribution beyond ourselves, then we're not really doing our job. So for people like us, we still have a lot of work to do in uh, getting into shape, you might say. Uh, on the physical plane, people talk about, you know, have you, are you in shape? Did you go to the gym? Did you do your exercise? All that. Okay, good. And the Greeks talked about that too. And uh, many of these uh, philosopher types in those early days, they would go to the gymnasium, you know, and uh, keep the body in shape. But it's not just the physical body. And it's mm. not, it, it, you know, you got to do that for each vehicle. And sometimes yeah. that, that straight alignment from top to bottom is very therapeutic, as, as you've been, you know, suggesting. Yeah. I have a friend back in New York. I mean, I don't know what it is, but I'm, I'm, I'm contacting people I haven't seen for 50 years. And um, why is that? Well, he goes to the gym every single day. And uh, in the early days when I knew him, I wouldn't have suspected it because he was a little bit portly, but very strong. And uh, But every, every single day, and uh, I just realized, my goodness, this man is living out his Virgo sun sign. Mm -hmm. And of course, Leo is on the ascendant and he wants to look good, even though he's 77 years old, you know, he wants to look good. <laughs> so he's going every day. Now, is it too much? I don't know. I'm not in the position to judge. It's, it's like a religion with him on the physical, physical level. And there are people who make of, uh, of, of bodily maintenance almost a religion, you can say. And, and, and it's, you know, it's like DK said, he says the Olympics and all these athletic events, this is part of training for the first initiation. Yeah. So, okay, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. But for people like us, we should be beyond that. Not to say that we don't pay attention, but he says you substitute emotional loveliness for your normal emotional condition and you substitute this mental clarity and discrimination for the usual mm -hmm. confusion and those are the areas that we yeah we we should be working in also yeah, yeah. okay thank you vera thank you and uh yeah let's see if there's anything else that i'm missing Am I missing anything else, Joe? I can't even find myself here. I don't see any more hands, and I don't see any other questions. Well, then maybe one's got to quit while the moment presents itself. But what about you and uh, Tuya? Do you have anything you want to bring up? Um, because I know you can't raise your hand. Um, but, you know, if you have something you want to say... You're most welcome. And if not, you know, on we go. Okay. 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 Thank you. Now, next. I don't have anything. Sorry, it took so long to again get this microphone functioning. Thank you. Tuya, can you put your mic up a little bit? To, to do what? Uh, raise yeah, the button. Anything else? Yeah, she said she had <laughs> trouble with her microphone. That's the problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Tui has been the messenger. We had a lovely visit here from some members of the group, and uh, and she's been doing the running back and forth to the train and the transportation, and you know, the life of constant pressure. But then I satisfied myself one day by um, reading in Agni Yoga, uh, I, the, the quote was something like this, that um, pressure is the law of existence. And I pondered on that and pondered on that and decided that it was justifying how I live my life. 
and um, I didn't have to question myself anymore. <laughs> but uh, I would say, you know, friends, that when you read Agni Yoga and the Tibetan simultaneously, something comes through, and I and I wouldn't exclude Blavatsky either. Something comes through which supplements everything. Everything supplements everything else. So in your spare time, in your busy lives and so forth, see if you can get a hold of an Agni Yoga book. And um, although there may be problems with translation here and there, I think Madame Rorick, you know, she was excellent at Russian, but when it came to English, maybe it was a little bit stilted at times. Uh, but still, you, you get the idea. Maybe carry an Agni Yoga book with you. They're very small, you know, and you can do that. And uh, Master Moria has written in such a way that he just has little paragraphs which stand alone. He says, there is a pattern to all this. You don't see it, but I know it. But nevertheless, uh, you can just chew on a paragraph. It's right there. And it's on a particular subject. And therein lies the triangle. Madame Blavatsky, Alice Bailey, Madame Rurik, The Secret Doctrine and Theosophy, The Blue Books, and The Acne Yoga Books. Another wonderful triangle to help build us up to what we should be. Okay, friends, then basically I'm going to just close this the way we normally do. When we look up in at the Great Invocation, we see a great triangle. Light, love, and power. And we, you know, we see a number of triangles in this thing. Uh, you know, because maybe we can include the plan, you know, the will of God, the race of men and the plan, that's another triangle. Purpose, will, plan, the effective method of instituting purpose, humanity, the instrument through which it has to happen. It's filled with triangles. And what I've asked you to do is cultivate the triangular consciousness. Namely, look at life, find opposites, and find also the point of balance that makes that very, very stable figure the triangle. And then we can get that geodesic dome, such as uh, Buckminster Fuller introduced, and the expansion and expansion of it until it approximates the sphere, which means that our temple is ready. And then we're ready to move on to other and greater things. So many blessings from all of us on the team that attempts to bring you things to think about and incorporate into your life so that you move beyond your present horizons and become a larger being, not larger than you already are. I mean, you become the larger being you already are and you realize it. The triangle is on its way to the circle you go through this, uh, what do they call those? Polygon, polygonation, <laughs> polygons. And the, uh, what's it called? That figure with uh, four triangles. It's the very first of the platonic solids. It's slipping my mind at the moment, but it's on its way to the sphere. Eventually, all life forms, he says in Cosmic Fire, tend towards sphericity. 
and only in the early days are they not spherical. Even the human being, inwardly, is tending towards sphericity. Some causal bodies may be ovals, and others spheres. Probably the sphere is the more perfect uh, figure. Okay, friends, the great invocation. And then tonight, uh, now notice, please, our experiment, we've done this uh, for a couple of years. When the ASK programs are being offered, we're, and I explained why earlier, we're at the 6 o'clock time, and actually that's what the text says, 6 a.m., 6 p.m. GMT. It's easier for some, more difficult for others, but it makes it possible here in Finland when the clocks move backwards. And considering the fact that at least one of us seems to stay up all night, and it's not I. I'm giving you an occult hint there. Okay. The Great Invocation. From the point of light, within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Om. 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 Okay, friends, if I ever say the great invocation incorrectly, which sometimes happens, please bear with me. Um, thank you. Thank you for being here. And uh, tonight, our, our normal triangles uh, broadcast at our normal YouTube link, which you certainly should have by now. So maybe we see you then at uh, 6 p.m. GMT. Uh, 8 p.m. our time here in Finland. And then we uh, move on uh, on the evening schedule with the usual reappearance of the Christ and uh, 
a dual day on Friday with the glamour, dissipation of glamour, and also the new cosmic fire discussions rather late, but, but please be aware uh, that unless I have to, I'm going to go with the time, which is uh, 6 p.m. Uh, no, is, is that correct? No, that's not correct. Um, I'm, I'm going with the time that is uh, 8 p.m. GMT, and that means it's 10 o'clock here at night instead of 11. And on we go. So we'll convert this. We'll put it on Makara. You can use it. You can recommend it. You can send it to others. I'm grateful for your presence and lots of love and many blessings, many blessings. See you soon.